So welcome to the welcome to the VAF seminar. And uh, uh, in in this month, Wisconsin is hosting with um, the first talk from Professor Huy Nguyen, who just started his um, uh, position at Maryland, and he's gonna talk about uh, what closeness and regularity of the muscus problem. Please. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. It's such a great pleasure to speak in this virtual analysis and PD seminar. Um, so the topic of the talk will be about some recent results on well poisonous and regularity for the muscat problem, which is a classical problem in uh, a free body problem in fluid dynamics. And it has uh, many exciting developments in the past 15 to 20 years. So um, the talk is by no means a, an exhaustive survey of the problem, uh, but it will focus on some of my own results with collaborators and uh, the most closely related ones. So, um, so, I, yeah, so I'll, I'll give an introduction to the problem and introduce um, different formulations and then discuss the local repulsiveness and together with blow up results and the final section will be about um, the global solutions. So um, the Muscat problem is named after Maurice Muscat, an American um, petroleum engineer, and it concerned multiphase flows in porous meter formed by a solid matrix, first cavities. And this kind of phenomenon is encountered in many branches of engineering and science, to, few, to name a few, um, in groundwater hydrology, in reservoir engineering, in oil, soil science, and chemical engineering, for example. Uh, it's mathematically, this is a uh, representative free boundary problems in fluid dynamics, in which both the unknown function and its domain must be simultaneously determined. Uh, it's also related to another well-known free boundary problem, the Healy Shaw problem uh, for flows between two closely re uh, spayed parallel plates. Um, so uh, these two pictures shows a, uh, an experiment of Healy Shaw. Um, in which we have two horizontal plates uh, with some fluid inside, and one injects another fluid through the center of the plates. Um, we can see in the first experiment, when we inject a more viscous fluid, then uh, the battery remain uh, regular. While uh, in the second experiment, when the injected fluid is, is, is less viscous, the barrier between the two fluids uh, become unstable and develops um, singular structures. Uh, so this problem uh, has many applications because various problems in microflows can be approximated by Hilly Shaw cell. So, um, uh, a prominent feature of flows in porous meter is that the equation of motion is given by the dark sea law, which is the red equation, where mu is. Uh, viscosity, the uh, um, dynamic viscosity of the fluid, U is velocity, kappa is the permeability of the uh, porous medium. And um, in the simplest setting here, we assume uh, that the uh, porous medium is homogeneous and saturated so that uh, the permeability is just a constant, a positive constant. P is the pressure of the fluid, G is the constant density, rho is the constant density of the fluid. And uh, here, E, Y, I think I, I think forgot to write something. So uh, for me, X is the horizontal direction and Y is the vertical direction. So, so X will be in RD, D will be one or two for physical dimensions. And E, Y is the vertical unit vector in the, in, in the Y direction. Right, so the fluid is incompressible so that the divergence is at the velocity is zero. Um, this Duxy law was first formulated based on experimental results, but then this uh, was rigorously derived from stock equations uh, by some average in procedure. So interestingly, uh, this Duxy law is very similar to the equation for flows in the Hilliard cell, uh, particularly in vertical Hilliard cell. Uh, when the driving force is gravity instead of uh, for uh, the horizontal cell that we saw in on the previous slide, the driving force is either uh, injection or suction. So for a vertical heat shot cell, the equations is given by this, where the only difference is the positive constant in front of the velocity. 
plates. Here, uh, edge is the distance between the plates. So mathematically, the uh, most of the problem and the vertical initial cell are equivalent, but not the horizontal one. So uh, let me now introduce uh, various formulations of, of this problem. Um, the setup, let's just take the simplest setup with two immiscible fluids of different constant densities in a porous medium. Um, the top fluid has density rho plus, the bottom has density rho minus, and the free boundary between them is the graph for simplicity, is the graph of some function eta, which depends on time. And again, x will be in Rd, y is in R. Uh, so um, this is the simplest setting, not only because we're considering only two fluids for multi-phase flow, but also um, there is no rigid barry in this picture. So usually, for example, we could have a rigid bottom for, uh, for, for, the, for the bottom fluid and another rigid barry on top for the top fluid. So we would say something about that later. Uh, but here in this simplest setting, we have the dark sea lore uh, in each fluid domain. And uh, the only boundary is the free boundary. So on the boundary, uh, we need boundary conditions to close the system. Um, first is that the normal velocity is continuous across the boundary. So capital N here is this normal vector, which is upward pointing. And we neglect the effect of surface tension by uh, imposing that the pressure is continuous across the barrier as well. So otherwise, the, the pressure jump has to be proportional to the mean curvature of the free barrier. Um, and uh, finally, the important condition which gives the evolution of the, uh, of the free barrier is that it moves with the fluid. And that translates into uh, an evolution equation for the surface eta, dt of eta is equal to the normal velocity restricted to the free boundary. Okay, so uh, this system of two Darcy law, two boundary conditions, and this uh, equation for the uh, surface eta is the two phase Muscat problem. We also discussed the one phase problem in which we replace the top fluid by vacuum. So uh, in that case, uh, the density and the viscosity are simply zero. Um, so a priori, this problem has five unknowns, right? The two velocity fields, the two pressure fields, and the free boundary. But this is a special feature of the Muscat problem that the entire problem can be recast in terms of the free boundary only. So that is the next slide. This is a free boundary problem for the. Uh, this is a, a PD for the free boundary only. So for simplicity, let's take first the case of the one phase problem, when again on top, we have vacuum. So the pressure is continuous. Therefore, the trace of the pressure at the boundary is zero. Uh, assume that we know the free boundary eta xt at some time t, and let's try to recover all the uh, fluid fields. So, Let's recall also the Darcy law here for the, uh, for the bottom fluid. We have only one fluid now. Uh, it is more convenient to introduce the so-called um, hydraulic head, Q, which is a combination of the pressure and uh, uh, the density times the height, Y. This is so that the Darcy law becomes uh, viscosity times velocity plus gradient of the hydraulic head is zero. And now if we simply take the version of this equation using the fact that the flow is incompressible, then we quickly uh, realize that the hydraulic head Q is harmonic inside the fluid domain. And when we take the trace at the boundary, it is the, the, just the constant density times the boundary. And therefore, if we know the boundary, then we can solve this uh, equation together with the K condition of theta because we assume no bottom, no rigid bottom. Uh, then we get the hydraulic head. And from, uh, if we go back to the equation, uh, this equation for the hydraulic head in, uh, in, in the middle of this slide, then we can get the normal component of velocity, which is important because uh, it, it just enters the evolution equation for the free boundary. So the normal component of velocity is 
just minus the inverse of the viscosity times the normal derivative of the hydraulic cat. And usually we denote this normal derivative of uh, Q is the Dirichlet to Neumann operator G associated to the domain with the free boundary eta. And now it is acting on the Dirichlet eta rho minus times eta. Okay, so I'll denote G minus eta for the Dirichlet Neumann associated to the bottom fluid domain uh, with the free boundary eta. Um, and because of that, the uh, one phase Muscat problem can be written uh, is this equation one, it's a very compact form. So dt of the surface is minus a positive constant times Dirichlet Neumann of eta acting on eta itself. So the free boundaries is indeed the only uh, unknown for, for, for this one phase problem. Uh, how about the case of two fluid? This is a bit more complicated, but uh, everything can be also recast in terms of the free boundary as follows. If we denote G plus eta, the Dirichlet to Neumann operator for the top fluid, when uh, the second variable, the vertical variable is above the uh, surface, um, then uh, the surface evolves according to this equation two, where the Dirichlet Neumann now is acting on some function that I denote by F minus. And F minus has to be found simultaneously with another function F plus from this system three. So the system, uh, the first equation is the difference between F plus and F minus. And the second one is some weighted difference of Dirichlet Neumann acting on F plus and F minus. So in fact, F plus and F minus, that's just a trace of the hydraulic heads of the top and the bottom fluid when, when we restrict them to the free boundary. So again, the, the only uh, unknown is the free boundary. And this formulation involves only the digital to normal operator. So that will be uh, the main object to study um, in the next couple of slides when we discuss the well postedness uh, problem. So, uh, and of course, uh, in the question three, um, I have divided by mu plus and mu minus the viscosities uh, because I'm assuming that they're both non, they're both positive. In fact, you can instead multiply them by the product, and um, this formulation reduces to the one phase when mu plus is zero. So uh, an, an, an advantage of this uh, reformulation using Dirichlet to Neumann is that it can easily accommodate rigid boundaries. For instance, when the bottom fluid is uh, below the free surface, but above some rigid bottom, even is the graph of some function B minus, then to define Dirichlet Neumann, we instead solve this elliptic problem with another uh, homogeneous Neumann condition at the bottom. And uh, that is related to another uh, formulation, the so-called uh, contour dynamics formulation, which is usually uh, more useful when there is no rigid bottom, no rigid boundaries, or the rigid boundaries are very nice, like this flat, because this contour dynamic formulation, although it is more explicit than the Dirichlet to Neumann, it relies on the explicit Newtonian kernel uh, of the domain. So in a sense, this doesn't like uh, uh, complicated uh, rigid boundaries. So uh, to derive this contour dynamic formulations, we notice that the Darcy law, the, Darcy law, the flow is irrotational in the interior of each fluid domain, but not uh, at the boundary. And therefore the vorticity is concentrated uh, at the free boundary Right, so gradient perpendicular dot u is the vorticity of the, of the flow. This is given by some vorticity strength omega times the direct function at the free boundary. Then using the views of our law, we can recover the velocity from uh, the vorticity. Um, so it's given by some integral operator where the kernel depends only on the free boundaries. It's acting on the vorticity strength omega. And this is valid so long as the point is not on the free value. So to, to recover the velocity at the free value, 
we want to take the, the trace. So, and um, the way it works is to take the trace in the normal directions uh, in both uh, fluid domains. And there is a jump of continuity of the velocity. So we do so and we combine it with the dark sea law and after certain considerations, we can get the contour dynamics formulations. I'm skipping some details of the derivation here and I'll show you the, the ultimate formulation. So uh, let's for simplicity, write out the formulation for the case when the free boundary is one dimensional, meaning that the fluid is two dimensional. Then the free boundary eta solves this equation for the right hand side is a singular integral operator with the kernel depends on the free boundary is acting on the opticity strength to make this strength. So uh, omega solves the next equation, which is linear, right? So it's linear with respect to omega. Um, the second term here is complicated terms is another singular integral operator. Depends only on the free boundary. And the right hand side is proportional to the slope of the free boundary. So the vorticity has the same regularity level. It is it's the slope of the boundary because uh, this operator is a singular, it's of order zero. And there are two constants appearing in this formulation the constant a mu and a rho. Sometimes they are referred to as the Atwood numbers where a mu, um, this, which is more important for us, is the quotient between the difference of uh, viscosity uh, and the sum of viscosity. So if we use this uh, control dynamic formulation, we see there is virtually no difference between one fluid and two fluid. So for two fluid, two fluid uh, mu plus and mu minus are both mu plus is zero, so the only simplification is that this constant a mu becomes one. Uh, but there's this, a huge difference for the case when the two fluids have the same viscosity. Uh, even though it is not the generic case, it's mathematically, it just simplifies the problem significantly. And because of that, uh, many results are proved for the case of equal viscosity, as we see later. Um, so one thing that we can quickly uh, observe from this system is that it has a, a natural scaling invariance. Uh, if eta is a solution, then the rescale function lambda eta of x over lambda and t over lambda is also a solution for any scale lambda. So in particular, the uh, scaling invariant spaces for uh, uh, the free boundary is the space of uh, Lipschitz functions, so it's just Lipschitz graph. Um, or if we use uh, L2 super left spaces, then this is the one with the index one plus dimension over two. D is dimension of the free boundary. And please stop me at any point if you have questions or um, you'd like some clarifications. So uh, let me uh, detail more about the case of equal viscosity, right? Then the, this complicated operator just disappear. And the second equation for vorticity has the explicit solution, which is vorticity strength is proportional to the slope. Then we can plug it back in the first equation for to get the self-contained equation for the free boundary. So it's given by this equation six. So again, dt of eta is certain coefficients times the uh, times a first order singular inner operator. So it's the first order inner operator uh, of the free boundary eta. So this formula was derived by Cordoba and Gansero in 2007. Great. Uh, can I ask the question uh, about the previous slide? So you said that surely if viscosity is the same, then it simplifies, but also did people consider in the literature if rho minus and rho plus are the same? It also simplifies. Oh, so so it, it wouldn't be a free boundary problem anymore. When, mm -hmm. Right, so to, to have a, a free boundary between two fluid, uh, I think people would consider always viscosity check. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But that's an interesting point. 
Okay, so, uh, all right. So one thing we can do immediately with this equation six for the case of two fluid with the same viscosity is to linearize it, right? To have a feeling about this equation, let's linearize it around the trivial solution, eta equal to zero. Um, then the right hand side becomes this minus the jump of the density over the viscosity. So I'm assuming mu is a common viscosity times the square root of the of the Laplace operator, it's, we are in fact in one dimension. The general is minus Laplace operator um, to the one half acting on the function itself. So we see that this equation is parabolic if only if this coefficient here is positive, meaning that the density rho minus needs to be greater than density rho plus, right? Uh, and that is conceivable, physically conceivable for the problem to be well posed right? when the to, uh, when the uh, bottom fluid is heavier than the top fluid. Um, and so mathematically, the problem is parabolic in this case, and otherwise it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not well posed in any super less spaces, say. Uh, and that leads me to uh, the well posedness results, where we will discuss in more detail the kind of stability condition we need to impose for the problem to be well posed. So let's start again with the case of equal viscosity. It's always the simplest case. So Cordoba and Gansido in the same paper that they, that they derived the contour dynamics, they also show the well posedness in the stable regime, again, when the bottom, bottom fluid is heavier. Um, so they prove that for any initial data, for any initial free value in the space, HD plus two in RT with D one or two, there's this is a unique local solution in the same space. And uh, in the, uh, if this condition is violated, meaning that the, uh, uh, the top fluid is, is lighter than the, than the bottom fluid, then Siegel, Kaflis, and Hauisen in a previous work show that the problem is ill posed in sewerless spaces. So uh, I would consider this a well posed in its result for, uh, for smooth data. Because the initial data is in this space, which is very regular. So, for example, the curvature is is, is, is more than continuous. So the curvature is at least C one C zero alpha. So it is about it. It is continuous. Uh, and so, a natural question is: um, Can one prove local well posedness that can accommodate uh, initial data which exhibit certain kind of singularity? So that leads me to the next result, which also accommodate viscosity jump, right? When the two uh, fluids have different viscosities, this is the result due to change uh, Berlin, Schoen, and Scholar. So they consider arbitrary viscosity and they take initial data exactly in H2, which satisfy the uh, Rayleigh-Taylor condition. So this is the red condition. It says that the pressure is increasing when I'm crossing the free boundary from the top to the bottom fluid. And this is again, physically uh, reasonable um, to expect in order for we're posing this to hold. Then under this condition on the initial data, they show that there is a unique local solution. So, of course, during the time of existence, this condition remains uh, true. So, uh, with this we're posing this result, the initial surface is only in H2. And therefore, the curvature is in L2, but this can be unbounded. It's just merely L2. Um, so let me make some remarks about the related condition. If we use the dark sea law for the fluids, we can rewrite the related condition for the pressure here uh, in this form. So it is the jump of the density times this positive factor plus the jump of the viscosity times the normal component of the velocity. So uh, we can make some simple observations when the case of equal viscosity, the second term drop. So this way the Taylor function is positive if and only if rho minus is bigger than rho plus as we saw. Uh, in general, it is it holds when uh, rho minus is greater than rho plus and when uh, the battery and the velocity is small. In fact, if the battery is small, then the velocity would be small because 
relation between the velocity and batteries, as we saw before, we can recover the velocity from the big battery. Uh, so another scenario where we can ensure this Rayleigh Taylor battery, uh, sorry, the Rayleigh Taylor conditions is when you have only one fluid. Right? So the one phase problem. Uh, then uh, we prove in, in our paper, we put that there that for the one phase problem with either infinite depth, meaning that there's no rigid bottom or when you have the present of the bottom, but it, uh, the only conditions we impose is that the bottom is the Lipschitz function, is the graph is some Lipschitz function. Then um, the Raleigh-Taylor condition holds so long as the free boundary uh, has certain regularity. This in fact, uh, three half plus epsilon. So, uh, we return to this later, actually in the same slide, but S3 half is the critical space, is the scaling invariant space. So, so long as we are slightly above scaling, uh, the one phase problem always satisfies the relative condition. So, this is unconditional for the one phase or the two phase uh, with uh, the correct uh, con uh, relation between the densities. Uh, let me make a side remark that uh, for the waterway problem, uh, which is related to this, but uh, the fluid uh, is modeled by the incompressible Euler equation. Uh, in finite depth, when you have one fluid above a, a fixed bottom, in order for the relative condition to hold, uh, it requires the smallest condition of the second fundamental, fundamental form of the bottom. Right. It's, it, and that's very different from the muscat that has to do with the special structure of the dark sealer. So uh, let me recall here the scaling of the problem. And uh, in terms of L2 space or L spaces, the scaling invariant space is this one again, the space with index one plus dimension over two, which scales exactly like uh, Lipschitz spaces, uh, sorry, like uh, Lipschitz functions. Uh, so in view of this, when d dimension d is equal to one, the previous result, even though it allowed for uh, unbounded curvature, is this in fact one half derivative of scaling. Right? The scaling in one d is three half. So that leads me to uh, an almost sharp uh, well positiveness, local well positiveness result for the general problem. Um, so we prove with Poisadev that for the Muscat problem in arbitrary dimension, and with or without viscosity jump, uh, in, with infinite depth or in the presence of rigid boundary, which are just Lipschitz, then if we take any initial data uh, in HS with S slightly uh, greater than the critical exponent, so it's, um, it means any subcritical space uh, satisfying the relative the condition, then there is this a unique local solution that depends continuously on initial data. So this, uh, on one hand, uh, covers on subcritical spaces. Uh, on the other hand, um, in view of the surlet embedding, um, the initial data is just slightly better than C1. So the curvature is, is indeed embedded in all dimension, and in dimension one, this is even, even not L2. Okay. So the approach that we use to prove this uh, almost sharp proportion results is uh, a para differential calculus approach. It turns out to be robust enough to also handle the effect of surface tension that I mentioned in some slides earlier, um, in which case the, uh, uh, the pressure jump is proportional to the mean curvature of the free boundary. So then in that case, we have a high order PD, it's, it's actually of, uh, of order three. And it's also allow us to take the uh, zero surface tension limit to recover uh, the problem without surface tension. But I'm not going to uh, discuss in detail uh, the case of surface tension here. Um, but I want to mention one, uh, one of the key ingredients in the proof using paradifferential calculus approach. Uh, which is parallelization of the uh, Dirichlet to Neumann operator, right? The main object uh, in, in this problem. So uh, the result is a bit technical, but let me try to, to state it. Let S be any subcritical index and a fixed a small number delta, say less than one half, and this is positive because we are subcritical. 
um, take any surface in HS plus one half, uh, we are allowed to go above one half because the problem is parabolic, it's first order. So in uh, when we do energy estimate, we will gain a half degree. Uh, take any function f in HS, then we can uh, have the following precise structure of the Dirichlet to Neumann with the domain f and acting on a function f. It can be expanded into the sum of two uh, paradifferential operators with the symbol lambda and v plus the remainder r. So here, the symbol lambda is explicit. It is first order. So lambda is a symbol, is a function of x, the position, and c, the frequency. So the order of c tells us the order of the operator. So in this case, it's of order one. It is more over elliptic. So it's greater than or equal to absolute value, absolute value of c. Uh, the other symbol here, B, V, are computed explicitly in terms of the free boundary and the function F. Uh, and the, the key point is that the estimate for the, uh, this estimate for the remainder. So if we measure the remainder in HS minus one half, all right, we shift uh, below one half because we know that we can gain one half. Uh, it's bounded by A in HS, no lose, no loss, but uh, multiply by this norm, which is HS plus one half minus delta. So we get a little bit delta uh, from HS plus one half. And that small delta allows us to choose the time parameter to be small uh, to close the a priori estimate. So this is just to give you a flavor of the approach. Um, to actually prove the result, we also need the other results for Dirichlet Neumann. For example, we need to prove the contraction uh, estimate when we linearize. Uh, the, uh, we need to do a contraction estimate when we compare two, two Dirichlet Neumann operators associated to two different domains. And we need to do uh, some kind of expansion like the one in this T1. So uh, the previous well posting this result is almost sharp in the sense that it's epsilon away scaling, so it's natural to ask uh, about the critical case. So uh, there is a nice result of uh, Hung Wing and Al Azhar last year, where they can uh, get well posting this local well posting this for the case of equal viscosities. So uh, they take any initial data in one dimension as well for the free boundary in H three half, which is critical. Uh, they prove that there is this uh, positive time and a unique solution in this class. The class of functions as a continuous in time is three happy in space together with this uh, weighted H2 norm being finite. Uh, so this is a non-trivial result. Uh, it uses in, uh, in a very careful way the structure of the nonlinearity to, um, and you can imagine that through uh, this second uh, weighted norm. So uh, uh, what's interesting about this critical uh, reposition is, is that the space S3 half is not embedded into Lipschitz. So this allows for initial uh, free boundaries with unbounded slope. And it makes use of the control dynamic formulations, which we saw because of the case of equal viscosity is, is so nice for this formulation. And one of the observations in this work is that if you take a function in S3 half, it's actually better than S3 half. It enjoys a logarithmic more derivative, but the additional modulus of continuity depends on the function itself, not just the size of the function. And as a consequence, the existing time t uh, depends on, on the initial data and not just the size of the initial data. So such a result in the critical space is still open in three dimensions, meaning that when the free surface is two dimension and in the general case of viscosity charm. Okay. So uh, with local web this a natural question is whether the solution can be extended to a global one or uh, does it depend on finite time singularity? And unfortunately, the, sec the, the, the answer is singularity. Um, so I'm going to recall here um, some kind of singularity that uh, have been proved in the literature. Um, the first kind is wave turning and loss of regularity. 
Um, also, for the two phase problem with equal viscosity, um, in the remarkable paper of Castro, Cordoba, Feverman, Gancedo, Lopez, Fernandez, they proved the existence of turning waves. Um, that is, there exists a class of smooth initial data which are graphs of functions such that the slope blow up in finite time. Right? This is not simply a, a breakdown of a parameterization of, the, of a surface, it's a graph. For the Muscat problem, it is much more severe than that because at the moment of turning waves, part of the behavioral fluid is on top of the light of fluid. So the, uh, the system enters the unstable re regime. Uh, nevertheless, because the problem is parabolic, uh, you can still continue the solution for a while, and it's, it remains uh, analytic for a short time. But after some later time, they proved that in, an, in another paper, that the solution lost, uh, lose regularity. Uh, the solution is no longer C4. So this is one type of singularity. Uh, another type of singularity is due to uh, self-intersection of, of the free boundary. And this is due to uh, uh, the collision of different particles on, on the surface. So there are two kinds of uh, self-intersection that's been studied. So intersection along an arc, sometimes called a splash singularity, or intersection at a single point, the splash singularity. Um, the, there's one result of Cordoba and Gantzido where they rule out the self-intersection along an arc. So, I mean, they rule out the splash singularity for the case of equal viscosity and for the one-phase problem. Now, the less severe singularities is, is of self-intersection as a single point uh, is also impossible for the uh, two-phase problem with the self-viscosity, but it does occur for the one-phase with the uh, for the one phase problem for a class of non-graph inertial surfaces. So initially you are already non-graph, you turn already and uh, uh, two fluid particles collide at some finite time. So the conclusion is that flows up are possible, but it's very sensitive with respect to the setting. You, either you have two phase with or without viscosity jump or you have one phase. And also on the geometry of the initial interface, so either it's a graph or non-graph, say. And because of that, global solutions can only exist in certain setting and regime. So that will be discussed in the last part of this talk, uh, global solutions, existence and uniqueness of global solutions. So, uh, so the, the most obvious regime is the regime of small data, right? because the problem is parabolic and flat surface is trivial solution. So uh, small regular data, leads to global solutions. Um, it goes back to uh, many previous works, but uh, I only mentioned here some more recent one due to Siegel, Kaflisch, and Hawisen, and Ambrose and Cordoba Gancedo. So um, unlike local repulsiveness for large data, because the problem is parabolic, even though it's quasi-linear and degenerate, uh, because it's parabolic, uh, it is actually easier to prove global solution in critical spaces, in scaling invariant spaces, than to prove uh, local repulsiveness for large data in subcritical spaces. So uh, let me uh, mention here a few words on uh, local repulsiveness for small data in scaling invariant spaces. First, consider the case of equal viscosities. Um, in that case, it, this is again another special feature of, of equal viscosity because this, this is the only case for the two phase problem where people know a maximum principle. So it was proved by Cordoba and Gansiro that if eta is a smooth solution of any time interval and the initial slope is less than one strictly, uh, then the slope remains strictly less than one for all time. And such a thing is not known when you have viscosity issue. Then uh, using this maximum principle later on, Constantine Cordoba, Gansiro and Strand uh, proved the existence of weak solutions uh, for any Lipschitz initial free boundary provided that the slope is strictly less than one right, in order to make use of this uh, maximum principle. However, um, uniqueness is not known right, 
by the way, the solution is continuous in space, time, and just in space. But uniqueness is not known. And the uniqueness question was basically answered in two papers of Cameron, uh, first in 2D and then in 3D. So the one that I'm stated here is actually the result he, uh, he obtained for 3D. It, I think it's better than 2D, so I'm going to state it uh, for, uh, for, 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 for 2D as well. So let's take any initial free boundary Lipschitz with the initial uh, slope less than one, and uh, it grows sublinearly at infinity. Okay, this, this is something additional to the maximum principle that we have to assume. Then there is this a unique uh, global solution. Is it in fact smooth, instantaneously smooth in positive terms? So the solution becomes C1 alpha space time and C11 in, in space. And we have this estimate, this decay for the, uh, for the C11 norm. So the decay is like one over T. And this is in fact the, 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 the key ingredients of this theorem because the, um, the other parts of our existence and regularity follows from this uh, modulus of continuity. Um, so the proof of this is based on the method of spontaneous generation and propagation of moduli of continuity due to uh, Nazarov, Kiselev, and Boberg in the context of the um, surface quasi-geotropic equation. Uh, and again, this nice result, right, when you have a small slope, the smallness condition is imposed just on the slope, uh, you have global smooth solution. This is only known for equal viscosity. Okay. So how about the case of viscosity jump? Uh, Constantine and other proved in two papers the first one is for 2D, the other one is for 3D, that when you consider arbitrary viscosity, you have local repulsiveness, I mean, existence and uniqueness. In the following scaling invariant norm, uh, the Wiener norm, it is defined as the integral of absolute value of the C times um, the Fourier transform of the C. So this space scale like the Lipschitz space, but it's strictly smaller than uh, the Lipschitz space. And in fact, the smallness condition in their paper is explicit. This is computable. Um, so that is one result for the case of uh, the general case of viscosity jump. And uh, last year, I, uh, I obtained another result for, for the same setting. When you consider arbitrary viscosity in any dimension, uh, then uh, we can have global repulsiveness in the scaling invariant vessel of norm, um, B1 and Fili1, so it's defined as follows. You take the PJ, the uh, little wood paley projection onto frequency two to the J, measure it in N Fili, multiply it by the way two to the J, that's, that's essentially one derivative, and sum in J. Okay. So this is also scaling invariant norm, um, this, is, this space is strictly larger than the window space, but it's still strictly smaller than uh, the space of Lipschitz graphs. Um, but uh, one interesting thing about uh, this space is that it can allow for um, functions that are neither periodic nor decaying. Really. So for example, this is one uh, explicit example. So, so for the Muscat problem, we have uh, local repulsiveness for large data. We have finite time blow up in certain setting and scenario. And in other setting and scenarios, we have uh, global repulsiveness for small data. Right? So it's again natural to ask, is there a setting uh, that can accommodate global repulsiveness for large data? And, and interesting, the answer is yes, it is the one phase uh, problem. So the hint is given by the following maximum principle for the one phase problem. If you have a sufficiently smooth solution on some time interval, then the slope is bounded by the initial slope, regardless the size of the initial slope. Right? So unlike the case of two fluid with the same viscosity, it is only known when the initial slope is less than one. So motivated by this, we prove together with Dong and Gansedo that uh, if you take any initial data in uh, Lipschitz, 
and periodic. Then there exists a function eta, which is continuous in time space, glitches in space. The derivative is L2 in space, L infinity in time. It solves the Muscat problem in the L infinity in, in time, L2 in space sense, and hangs almost everywhere. And moreover, this is the unique specific solution. It's, in fact, it's come from the fact that uh, smooth solution enjoy the comparison principle. So, um, so, so let me say some words about uh, this results. Uh, so we prove this results by a combination of both the Dirichlet to Neumann reformulation and the control dynamic reformulation. So eighth is the, uh, re, uh, is the Dirichlet to Neumann formulation for the one phase. And we can rewrite the Dirichlet to Neumann um, in a similar fashion to the control dynamic formulation. So here for any function eta and g, the display Neumann operator associated to the domain with the Barry eta uh, acting on a function G is given is this uh, is this uh, singular integral operator acting on the vorticity omega and vorticity solve the second equation, right? It's pretty much similar to the formulation we saw before, except that this is in the periodic setting. So we see uh, the appearance of a hyperbolic and uh, trigonometric functions. So the solution that we proved in, in the previous theorem solve this uh, system nine and 10 um, in MVDL2, and this is the unique viscosity solution of the system. Uh, so instead of going to discuss the strategy of proof, I think I will spend the last slide uh, on a very recent paper which appeared two weeks ago, and is related to, to um, the result that I just stated. Um, right, so the question is, do global Lipschitz solutions in the previous theorem smooth out instantaneously? Right? And the answer is no. And this is, uh, this is called the waiting time phenomenon, which has been proved before for the horizontal Healy shore, not vertical, but horizontal Healy shore cell um, due to injection for example, by the work of King uh, Lacey Vasquez and Choi Kim. Uh, for the uh, Muscat problem, or equivalently for the vertical Healy Shaw uh, problem, this was proved two weeks ago by uh, Agrawan, Patel, and Wu. So they construct a class of initial free surfaces with isolated acute corners that lead to unique local in time solutions such that the corners are rigid. That is, the angle of the corner is preserved for a finite time. There's no rotation at the tip of the corner and the particle at the tip remains at the tip. So uh, this shows clearly that there's no uh, instant smoothing uh, when the initial uh, slope is large, right? Because uh, in, in this class, the, uh, the, the corner, um, the angle of the corner has to be acute. So, uh, Therefore, it's not known if we have instant smoothing for small slope or not, right? For example, when the, uh, the angle of the corner is, uh, is, is, is very close to pi, say. And uh, for any Lipschitz surfaces, do we have eventual regularity? This is also an open problem. And I like to stop here. Thank you. Thanks a lot for you for your great talk. Um, are there any questions or discussions that you want to uh, discuss with me? Uh, yeah, maybe so while we are waiting for questions, can I ask you a simple question? You said that for, uh, for two different, uh, I mean, for, for the two-phase problem, there's absolutely no available uh, or nothing is hopeful for any maximum principle? Um, it's not known. Um, anything like that would be <laughs> very significant. Um, so for two fluids with the same viscosity we have, for one fluid we have, but uh, something between that, no. <laughs> Even when the two viscosity is very close to each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not perturbative. It's a, it has to do with the algebraic structure of equation. So uh, we don't know. Yeah. Um, but but maybe the method of proving regularity is perturbative. Yeah. 
mm. but it's just that the maximum principle is not yet. Mm. Uh, yeah, maybe let me ask the second question if uh, why, why waiting. And also, I mean, do people do some sort of asymptotic expansions? I mean, of course you said that it's not um, uh, put to bite uh, in, in those algebra, right, structure yeah. the equations, but in general, do you have some put sort of like asymptotic expansion in terms of the order of the difference of viscosity or difference of rho plus minus rho minus, so if they're still, uh, still regarding the maximum principle, right? No, it, it, it just in general, are there sort of um, no, asymptotic I, results I concerning? Guess, I guess, um, no, not that I know of. But that would be interesting, yeah. But I haven't seen anything like that. Uh, so, for example, when you have the equation three, I mean, there, there, there was when you consider the the the, the two um, uh, two two phase problem, you know, mm -hmm. in the work with um, um, this one, right? Uh, then when yeah, when you have two phase, there 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 was equation three that you wrote down in your work. Uh, oh, in in my work with. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, I mean the, the 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 very earlier one, the the maybe one of the first slides. This one. Um. um uh, yeah. That 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 one. I mean, like, so. Yeah. Can you explain a bit better? I mean, like, if we only look at equation three, can we sort of see the regularity? Um. Uh, sort of. Is there any possible? Um. I mean, to... some 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 better insight for this three so uh the three um so wait, we have to solve this equation for f plus and minus assuming we know uh, eta uh and we know that Dishley neumann for the the way i defy it because I, I fixed the normal vector to be upward pointing so Dishley neumann for the bottom fluid is a positive operator and for the top fluid is going to be negative mm -hmm. um so uh, the whole left hand side has a side is a is a negative operator Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is why if we can isolate the principal part, which is uh, of the operator, right, then we can invert it and, and, uh, and solve for f. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly how we did it. So we did expansion for g eta, uh, not only just to study this equation, but also allow us to, to invert the system three. Mm, I see, I see. Yeah, so you can think of it as sort of two-step method. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and the principal part is given in this uh, part differential reduction here. So this is the expansion. And what is more interesting to me is that, in fact, for the two-phase problem, when we have to impose the Rayleigh-Taylor condition, uh, that function Rayleigh-Taylor is actually a combination of these things, mm. just one or two manipulations. Uh, when we insert this into the system three that you just mentioned, we get that way the function pops up. Great. At least I understand it. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, let's see. Are there any questions or comments? Okay. If not, then let's thanks for you again for the great talk. Thank, um, thank you. Uh, and I, I know that we overlap with your similar at um, at Maryland. So sorry. My, we, uh, uh, but for, fortunately, the talk this week has been okay. canceled. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so we, we don't make any disturbance to you guys.